Welcome to uh, More Than This, uh, study guide number six. The subject is Amazing Grace, one of my favorite subjects in all of the Bible to talk about. Uh, we have already looked at uh, the previous lesson, which is called The Problem, and there's a couple review questions in the beginning of the guide here, so go ahead and turn to that. Uh, you'll look here at the top, it says Review. And so, question 6-1 asks, uh, or states, sin is breaking God's law. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Uh, we are told in 1 John 3 and verse 4 that sin is lawlessness. 6-2, my sins separate me from God. That's also true. So God didn't go anywhere. We decided to transgress. We decided to trespass and go out of his uh, presence and kingdom and his will and to do that which we felt like doing ourselves, which was sinful. And so that's why we're separated from God is our own sins. 6-3, are we all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Absolutely. Every person who has ever lived is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and they're going to have to give an account for the way that they lived, whether good or bad. 6-4. Are all people sinners in need of God's righteousness? Yes. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner. And so we all need God's righteousness in order to be saved. So we now look in the subject of amazing grace. And uh, how sweet the sound, right? So we are looking at uh, here the idea that grace, grace is a gift. Grace is uh, a gift from God. And uh, where we read that is in Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So... Um, Eternal life is not received as the wages of righteousness. No, it is the gift of God. So when you, uh, um, you know, you have a job and you've, you've worked your, uh, say, two weeks. And, uh, and so, you know, in, in the days before direct deposits were popular, you used to have to be able to go to a pay window uh, or your boss would give you uh, your pay paycheck every two weeks. Remember those days? And uh, what if you, you know, you, after you're working a couple of weeks, your uh, supervisor came and gave you your, your check and said, hey, here's your gift from the company. What would you feel about that? Like, that is no gift at all. I, I worked 80 hours for that thing. That's not a gift. Those are wages. Those are uh, things that I've earned. Okay. So the wages of sin is death, which means that we've been working at earning. <laughs> death because we have been sinning. It's a paycheck for what we've done. So, you know, sort of like God writes us a, a, a payroll check saying uh, to uh, to the order of uh, spiritual death, sign God. And unfortunately, it's got our name, page of the order of, right? So, but in Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death. Thankfully, he continues and says, but the gift of God is eternal life. In the Bible, a gift is something that you can never earn. It's not something you can work for. It's not something that you deserve. In the Bible, a gift is always means it's something that someone gives to another out of love. Okay, so watch how this works. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 through 10, it reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Uh, this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So in verse 8, it says very clearly, it is by grace you have been saved. How does God save us? Well, earlier on in the first lesson, we saw that the Bible says that we are saved by the gospel. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. 
And so that's true. But now the Bible says another statement on how we're saved. We're saved by grace. We're saved by the grace of God. We're saved by grace through faith. And this isn't of ourselves. It's not through ourselves. It, there we see it again in verse 8 of Ephesians 2. It is the gift of God. Not by works. No one can boast about that. We're not saved by works. There's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. Because salvation is a gift from God to us. That's probably one of the best definitions of grace there is. To 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 be benefited or to have mer uh, to be blessed, even though you don't deserve it, you haven't earned that. You're you're not um, deserving of it. So, so in question six six, it says we are saved because we're good moral people that go to church. Well, that's actually false. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by going to church or doing the things that you see Christians do. Christians do those things because they are saved. But the only reason why we can be saved is by God's grace. And so that's why it says, uh, question 6-7 says that it is by grace that we can be saved. So... Grace means that God is, is forgiving us even though we don't deserve it. He is gifting us salvation out of his love. It is a gift. It's not something that we earn, something that we work toward and deserve. It's, it's a present. It's a present out of love, the love for God. And so... In 6-9, it says we must have faith in order to have God's grace save us. So God has provided us this gift out of his love. He offers to save us. He offers us grace. But now the question is, what's my response? What's my uh, uh, role in this? Well, God offers me a gift, and the way that I respond to that gift is called faith. And that means that in order to get God's grace to save me, I must have faith in Jesus Christ. And, and if you think about it, if you've ever read any of the Gospels or anything, that uh, uh, the words of Christ continually more than anything else, he says, believe in me, believe in me, have faith in me, and you'll have eternal life. Our, our life, our spiritual life, our, our, our eternal life, our salvation is only possible by believing in Christ. Now, the, the next lessons that we'll be looking at after this subject, we'll be talking about faith in great detail. But until then, basically, God says, I want, I want to offer this gift to anybody who wants it. Any sinner out there who wants to be saved, I am offering you the gift of salvation. But there's a condition, and the condition is that I must have faith in order to receive that gift, okay? So um, let's say uh, that there was um, a young boy who was living in a, in a tenement uh, apartment building in, in New York in one of the worst areas of New York City, and it was a terrible place to live. His mother was working two jobs. He had no father. And uh, he would come home from school and go into the apartment and have to climb the steps and he'd go past drug dealers and prostitutes and loud music and arguments. And, and uh, he just would hurry his way up to his apartment, close the door, throw his backpack on the bed, go into the kitchen, grab something like a snack after school, you know, a banana or something like that. What this kid really enjoyed doing was going up to the roof of the house, of the apartment building. And he would go up on the very, very top and, and get out there and it was just open air and he got away from all the music and the arguments and the drugs and uh, the cussing and all that stuff. And he got away from that. He would just sit up there on the rooftop and, and he and he had a chair and he built and he had a, got a little table that he put in there. And, and so he would just get up there and eat his snack and he would wait up there until it started getting dark and uh, his mom would come home. And uh, it was sort of his sanctuary. And uh, 
Uh, so one day he comes home from school, back back on the bed, grabs a shack, heads up the stairs, goes all the way to the roof, and starts walking out there, and he looks at his chair, and there's somebody sitting in his chair. And he doesn't like that. That's his chair. And so as he gets closer, he realizes this is an old man, a quiet elderly man who's sitting in that chair. And so, um, you know, he walks up to the man and he's about ready to say something. And the old man looks at him in his face and he says, I'm sitting in your chair, aren't I? And uh, he goes, yes, it is. And, and, the, and the old man said, well, listen, I'm sorry. And he starts to get up and then the kid kind of feels bad a little bit. And he says, no, 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 that's OK. You, you, you can stay there. And uh, so the old man basically says, I just moved into this building. Uh, they condemned my apartment building. And so um, I had to, everybody had to move out and I just moved into this one. And in the other building, I used to love to come up on the roof and get away from everything. And the kid goes, me too. That's why I have this up here. And so they started talking and it was, it was really good. It was so good. I mean, eventually, you know, the two chairs on each side of the little table and, and the old man was, didn't really have anybody, had nobody in his life. And, and this kid had never had a grandpa. And so they would spend the afternoons after school and, and, and the old man would share with them insights and stories and give him some wisdom. And, and the, and the, and the, and the kid just loved him. And, uh, it was, it was really, really good. Well, the old man had a doctor's appointment and the doctor gave him the news that he, he probably only had a couple weeks to live. And so, um, so that afternoon when the kid came up to the roof, the old man uh, was sitting there, but he wasn't jovial and warm and smiling. He was very serious and intense. And uh, the kid uh, said, hey, how's it going? And, and the old man looked at him, he said, Son, I need you to answer a question for me right now. What are you going to do to get out of this place? What would it take for you to be able to escape living in this place? And the kid goes, well, if I had a guitar, I'd learn how to play that guitar, and I'd become the best guitarist in New York City. And the old man said, that's all I need to know. And he got up and he walked away. And the kid's just like, wow, what happened? Man, that was intense. And he didn't understand it. Of course, the old man didn't tell him about his prognosis and how short a life he had left to live. And so the next afternoon when the, when the, when the boy went up to the roof, he wasn't as anxious to get up there. He was a little bit hesitant but he got there and there's the old man and and he's sitting there and the old man's got a big smile warm smile to greet him and and the boy you know sits down and and um, uh, he says to the old man he says is everything okay and and the old man says today's a good day today's a really good day in fact uh, I've got something that I want to give you and he opens up his tweed sport coat and reaches inside and pulls out a piece of paper and he, and he gives it to the boy and the boy opens it up and it's a receipt. Yeah, it's a receipt for a guitar and an amplifier and cords and straps. And it's, the kid can't believe how much all of that cost. He looked at the bottom and his eyes just got really big and, and uh, it right across all across the, Receipt, it's stamped, paid in full. And, 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 and so, is this for real? Is this for real? And the old man says, yes, yes, it's yours. It's from me to you. And, and so, you know, he said to the boy, he says, what are you waiting for? Go on. And man, he went all the way down those stairs, got to a bus, took a bus to the music stop. He walked into the music store and he has this piece of paper, he goes up to the counter and the guy says, we were wondering who the old man was buying for. You know, he bought the best. Man, look at this, you got this guitar and, and he brought out the amplifier and all this stuff and he, and you know, and everybody in the store was really excited for the kid, you know. So he packed it all up, put it on the bus, went back and 
started, you know, plugging everything in and trying to learn how to do this and that. And uh, he was super excited and had a lot of hope, you know, wow, maybe I can be the best guitarist in New York City. Um, you can imagine the shock of that news when he found out that the old man had died. And he was devastated. And he didn't even go to the funeral. He didn't want to because he didn't want to see him in a box. He wanted to, the last thing in his mind when he thought of him was up there on that roof talking. And, and the boy's mother became very concerned because he, he would just stay in his room. Oh, it wouldn't go on the roof anymore. He'd just stay in his room playing that guitar and playing and playing and playing. And, and sometimes she would come in and bring him something to eat. And, and there were times where he wouldn't even eat that but she could just hear him play and play. She'd go in there and sometimes his fingers were bleeding. He was playing so much and so hard. And so, a couple questions. Why did the old man give that kid the guitar? Was it because the kid earned it or he owed it? Did he owe it to that boy? No, no, he didn't. Why was he so generous? Because he knew that if he didn't give the kid the guitar, the chances were that he was never going to be able to escape this terrible, terrible life that he was stuck in. And so he gave the kid what the kid could never have himself. Another question is, is why did the kid work so hard on playing that guitar? Was it because he realized this is my ticket out? This is the ladder out of this pit. I do, I'm, if I get really good at this, I'm gonna be able to get out of here and take my mom with me. I'm sure, absolutely, I'm sure that was part of it. But don't you imagine that one of the reasons why he worked so hard on that was because he was grateful. He was grateful for the gift that the old man gave. And you see, if you take the word grace and the word attitude and you put them together, you get the word gratitude. This boy was grateful. He had an attitude of gratitude, didn't he? And that's the reason why he worked so hard on that. You see, grace is a gift. And unless God offers that, we're not going to get it. And it's going to be way more than we can ever afford ourselves. We can't pay for our own salvation. So, you see, our response to that is also important. The old man bought him the gift. The receipt was in his hand. What if he never went on the bus and went to the store? Well, that would be ridiculous. He would never benefit from all of that, you see. No, his response to it was to was to go and get it and to open it up and to do it and to use it, you see. And that's 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 the response. That's faith. That's faith in response to the gift, you see. So in Romans chapter three and verse twenty-two through twenty-four, it says that this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So Christ made it possible to be justified freely by his grace. You see, we're righteous not because we've stopped doing bad things and started doing good things. No, we're, we're made righteous by Christ. We're made righteous because of our faith in Christ. And you see, everybody sinned. Everybody's fallen short. But it doesn't just say that. It says in verse 24 of Romans 3, and are justified freely by his grace. You see? And the reason why is because we believe. We believe. So 6-10 asks the question, Christ made it possible to be justified freely 
by his grace? The answer to that is, it's true, isn't it? It is true. Now, in John chapter 19, it records the death of Christ. John is the only apostle of all the 12 apostles who was actually at the crucifixion. Uh, the others were scared. Uh, Judas, of course, Iscariot has, has committed suicide, realizing what he's done to betray Christ. Peter's ashamed after denying him three times. And so he's, and all the others are scared to be, they're going to be crucified also if they are, are caught. And so everybody's gone except for John. And John is the only one there to see it with his own eyes, what happened to the Lord. And it says in John 19, in verse 28 and following, let's read that together. It's, it has everything to do with the subject that we're studying, okay? In John 19, 28 later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus has now died. And he now it says in verse 31, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Now, let me stop right there. The reason they, they asked for the legs to be broken was because that would speed up their death. The crucifixion was supposed to take a long, 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 long time to execute the criminals. And that was one reason why people were very <laughs> obedient to Roman laws, because they would definitely not want to be crucified. But in order for them to breathe, they need to push up on their, their feet, even though they were nailed. And, they, and that was the way to get air in and out of their lungs. They would, so they would speed up and expedite the execution by taking uh, and breaking their legs. And so it says uh, they asked that the legs be broken. So the soldiers, in verse 32, says, The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. And I, I, I don't know if you know that, but Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And, uh, and so it says in verse 33, But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with the spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water that came out of the wound from his chest cavity. And then it says in verse 35, the man who saw it has given testimony. And his testimony is true. And he, he knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may also believe. It's fascinating that as John is, is recording and, and narrating what happened at the cross, it, right now in this verse, he stops and he says, I want you to know that I saw this. I know this to be true because I was there. And so he says, I'm telling you the truth about this. I'm testifying about what I saw that day because I want you to believe. Powerful. So powerful. Now, in verse 36, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And that was a prophecy about the dying Messiah. In verse 37, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Another prophecy. This one, 900 years before Christ. So, it leads to a question. The question is, and we're here in 611, why did Jesus allow himself to be crucified? He was innocent. He was sinless. He never did anything wrong. He didn't deserve it. And he allowed it to happen. You know, he could have stopped it. 
He could have called 10,000 angels, one song says, but he died alone for you and me. Why? Why did he allow himself to die? Especially a, such a torturous, incredibly terrible, horrific kind of death. Why would he allow himself to be crucified? That was to save us. It was to save me. It was to save you. We need saving. What we've done is sinful. It deserves punishment. Every time you break the law, right? So, but the reason why Jesus died and the reason why he allowed himself to be crucified is because we needed saving. And because he loves us. That's why. So, here's a really... Big question I'm going to ask in chapter, uh, excuse me, question 612. Can the good things we do improve on the work that Christ did on the cross? No. Nothing we do can make that better or improve it or complement. No. What he did is what he did. And the reason why he did it is because he loves us. But we can't, by our good deeds, add to anything that Christ did on the cross. Now, we can do things because we're grateful for his work on the cross. But going to church and giving money and taking communion and, and helping people out and, and all those things do not add to what Christ did. You see, he paid for the meal and the tip. He paid for it all. There's another great song about that. Jesus paid it all. He did. Now, so our works, our service to God does not, does not earn us salvation. No, no, Jesus did it for us. All right. So the bottom of the lesson is Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 through 14. And, and it talks about what grace does, right? So for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Man, I just love this passage. It is so helpful to understand that grace is a gift. When we get that grace, it comes inside of us. It changes us. Just like that kid playing that guitar. You know, that music changed him. Made him better. Made him fuller. Made him more alive. It gave him something to do. Gave him a purpose. Grace, when it comes inside of us, when we receive it through faith, when we, we say, yes, Lord, I want that gift, and we open that gift, and we enjoy that gift, that grace comes inside, and it, it changes things in us. It improves us, okay? And in here, it's, it, it does say, it's, it teaches us. See that in verse 12? Grace teaches us. Grace is the teacher. And it teaches us to say no. No to what? Ungodliness. Worldly passions. When you know what price Christ paid for our salvation, that gift, then, then, then when I appreciate and have gratitude for that gift, then that gift teaches me I'm not going to keep sinning. I'm not going to keep being ungodly. I'm not just going to give in to my what's called worldly passions and the word lust and desire come into mind, all kinds of carnal things, fleshly things, you know, all kinds of things come to mind. Worldly passions is just living for the flesh. And grace, when it comes inside of us, says, no, no, we died to that. 
We're no longer doing that. We repent from that. Okay? Now, guess what else? It also teaches us to say yes. It teaches us how to live. We know how not to live. But watch what it tells us. To live self-controlled. Wow, that's a big, heavy word, isn't it? That just means I am telling my body, you are not going to do what you think you want to do. You want to do something bad. I'm not going to let that happen. I've got control over this beast <laughs> that's very strong, isn't it? Right? So grace teaches me to live self-controlled. I am not going to allow my flesh to take away my gift from God. It also teaches me to be upright. That's a, just a great word. It just means living right, thinking right, acting right. Watch this. Speaking right. That's what upright means. And godly lives. Oh, if you just want to know what a godly life looks like, look like at the, the, the life of Christ. You're going to see what a godly life looks like. Look at his life. Look at the Apostle Paul, if you will. You're going to see a perfect, wonderful, beautiful example of a godly life when you see and look at those two. All right. So he gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness. He redeemed us from that. Praise God. And to purify for himself a people. That's us. To purify us. We couldn't clean ourselves up after our own mess. We couldn't wash this stuff off. No, it took him to do that. Actually, it took his blood to do that, didn't it? To purify himself for a people. And at the end of verse 14, who are eager to do what is good. So people who have grace, understand grace, accepted grace, received grace, are grace people. They are grateful and they are eager to do what God wants. If God says, I'd like you to assemble with my other children and worship me on Sundays, guess where they are on Sundays? In a worship service with others. Because that's what God wants. And if God tells them he wants them to pray, they pray. If God tells them that he wants them to give a portion of what they've earned back so that the ministries can happen and, and more people can be uh, hear, hear the gospel then we give, then we pray, then we serve, then we help, then we, we learn. God says, learn. I want you to crave for my word. I want you to grow in knowledge and, and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we do. We, we grow. Why? Because I have to? That's not why I do. I'm a preacher. You would think that I come here on Sunday morning because it's my job. And I come here to earn a paycheck. No, I'm here because I want to be here. It just so happens I am the preacher. And it just so happens I get compensated for that. But I've always prioritized God's will. And, and so if he wants me to, that's what I want. Working hard on that guitar, right? Working hard on that guitar. Yeah, yeah. Well, the lesson's yours. And I hope that uh, maybe you've learned something that you you haven't seen yet or or this is unpack some of that mystery about the grace of god you'll see my email address on the front of this if you need to reach out to me you can do that you, there's also a phone number there you can text me if you'd like okay my name is john mccraney god bless